Excellent. Whoops. Welcome to our second Zoom for Feathers in Flight, Vultures and Volumes with Mike Stake tonight. You want to roll to the next slide, Mike? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. And just to go over a little bit about our staff, we have, of course, Kelly Sorensen, our executive director, who is not with us tonight, but runs the ship. We have Condor Joe Burnett, who is out in the field today. Um, they're accepting the new chicks that we're going to be getting for San Simeon. We have in the field, Darren Gross, Evan McGreef, and Kara Fadden, who are also helping Condor Joe tonight. We have Mike Stake with us, who is presenting. Myself, I am Kathy Hamilton, um, the office manager. And we have Joan Biddle, our communications coordinator. And Elizabeth Lowe, who brings up the membership. And of course, um, I don't have mentioned all the names, but our education staff, who is out educating the future stewards. All right. This is our second Zoom chat for our Feathers in Flight event that started on September 4th and ends September 12th. So this Sunday, it is full of, it has an online auction. We have a 23 Vultures uh, in the World Photo Challenge. We have a couple other Zooms, um, one more on Thursday, which is gonna be a phenomenal Condor Sanctuary tour with Kelly Sorensen and Joe Burnett. We have our photo finish with Joan and I on Sunday where we're going to be going over all the photo submissions and going over some fun um, awards and highlighting uh, a few great photos. Next slide, please, Mike. So just a reminder, the next one, the auction has a lot of fun stuff. We are adding things every day. Um, I'm trying to finalize it all, but we keep kind of getting um, new items. So I, I definitely won't say no, and we're adding things. So definitely go back and check. Um, next slide, please. Has travel packages. We've got um, food and wine, we've got great jewelry, scars, we've got new VIP boxes that we added today, and we have a beautiful Kingpin plushie um, where we're memorializing uh, Kingpin who uh, perished in last year's Dolan wildfire, and we have a limited edition with a wonderful wing tag um, of Kingpin's number. All right, next slide, Mike. And just a reminder, we have 23 Vultures of the World Photo Challenge going on right now, where we are inviting everybody to share vulture photos. We are looking to find all 23 species. Um, we're getting close. We're having a, we have a lot of submissions, but we uh, do have a few that we are missing. We'll, we'll let you know which ones those are a little bit later. And I believe without further ado, um, we have, uh, again, Mike Stake, who is going to be talking vultures in volume. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Anyway. And, and uh, Kathy introduced our condor field crew, which are out in the field right now, transporting condors to San Simeon. And they will arrive this afternoon down there. So if you're still near your computer after today's talk, uh, you can check out explore.org and you can see the birds being transferred into the pen. And so uh, uh, that's an opportunity to get a good look at the new arrivals uh, this afternoon to San Simeon. Well, vultures, they tend to occupy the background of our world. We see them as we drive to work, uh, 
we just sort of see them in the distance quite often soaring overhead. Usually the turkey vultures, unless you're in the Big Sur area or, or Pinnacles National Park, you might see condors, but most areas you see the, the turkey vultures and might be a roost kind of like this. A lot of people I think would prefer to keep them in the background. I've had people tell me that con uh, condors and vultures are, are nice birds at a distance but up close, maybe not the most attractive uh, birds. And they have a lot of characteristics in common. And we have a hard time, I think, separating the connection between vultures and death. And we also have a hard time separating the appearance of birds from our own personal feelings. We, we, uh, attribute characteristics like they're kind of they're kind of dark and brooding they're maybe a little bit uh, uh, surly in nature and perhaps those attributes are not far off but there is a lot to love about vultures and if we take a closer look they might surprise you and in fact I've led condor tours and I've had people tell me at the end of the, the tour how much they now appreciate condors and find them beautiful. Well, this is a king vulture. And if we have the stereotype that vultures are all kind of dark and not very colorful. That's not entirely correct. The king vulture is an example of a bird that has a lot of color and and these birds tend to have more coloration on their heads which usually are unfeathered. And here we see a, a sample of some vultures the one on the upper left is an Andean condor. It's similar to the California condor, but if you spread its wings, it's, it's a little bit bigger. The Andean vulture stretches to nearly 10 feet in wingspan, whereas the condor is more uh, nine and a half feet. And of course, they occupy the Andes mountain range, very high elevation species. And really you can find vultures over much of the globe, occupying high mountains to uh, deserts and all habitats in between. If we go clockwise, we see an Indian vulture. This kind of has the more typical vulture silhouette, if you will, kind of hunched over the, the bare head, typical stance of a, of a vulture. Then a much smaller one, uh, the Egyptian vulture, and then going around the circle, Lammergeier, also called the bearded vulture. This is another high elevation species that specializes in bones. It consumes bones, and so that's a very unusual attribute for a, for a vulture. As well as the palm nut vulture in the center on the bottom, this is a one that does not necessarily scavenge. And so that breaks the stereotype of vultures all being obligate scavengers. Most of them are. And then we have lower left the Rupel's vulture. That's been documented as the highest flying bird. And at over 30,000 feet, I believe it must have taken an airline pilot to document that probably a surprise to, uh, to that person as he was flying. Well, not all character, characters of vultures are menacing and, and mean looking. Uh, Bird Orable has made these drawings of uh, vultures that uh, have, have a less uh, menacing appearance. And it shows all 23 species and actually more than half of those species are endangered, many of them critically endangered like the California condor that you see on the bottom row. 
So this is kind of going by size. The smaller ones are in the upper row and the larger ones in the lower row. The endangered ones tend to be the birds in the genus Gyps. That's G-Y-P-S. And these birds have undergone a lot of different problems depending on where they live. And we can sort of look for some of these in the middle two rows where we see the white rumped vulture, that's critically endangered, slender bill vulture, um, I believe that one's not a, that one I'm not sure if it's a gyps, but uh, Ruppel's is, white backed Indian vulture, cape vulture, those are all gyp vultures. And they have the typical rounded head and that sort of hunched appearance the white ruff around their necks uh, makes us think of, of vultures. So when we think of a vulture crisis, we're, we're not thinking of a crisis being that there are too many vultures. We're thinking about the crisis being there aren't as many vultures as there used to be. And this is a historical photo taking taken in uh, New Delhi, India, long ago, back, well, not too long ago, but uh, up until the 1980s, it was not uncommon to see 15,000 vultures in any one given place. They're nature's cleanup crew, and so they assemble in large groups and take care of the carcasses that uh, could otherwise pollute the environment. But nowadays, rather than millions of vultures, we're dealing with population sizes in the thousands, and sometimes in the low thousands. So since the 1980s and the next couple of decades, several species declined by more than 95%, and a couple of them, as much as 99% of their global population gone. So if we were going to a vulture reunion, we would find fewer vultures present after 2000. Kind of a depressing sight. Populations for some vulture species have declined more than 95% in the 1990s. Well, okay, how are they doing now? That's the question. So I went in search of vultures in India. This was just before COVID hit. This was in December of 2019. And I decided to make a trip to India and I thought, well, let's see how many of the nine species of vultures that are in India, how many can I find knowing that the populations have declined by so much. So I'm gonna take you on maybe a five to 10 minute journey of India. And, and maybe that's the best way to tour India these days with COVID, just a, a 10 minute virtual tour. We'll go by Jeep, we'll go by boat, we'll go by larger Jeep, one that's protected against tigers. We'll go by uh, rickshaw, we'll take a train and we'll also do a little bit of walking on foot and we'll see if we can find some vultures. We have nine possibilities from the red-headed vulture all the way up to the Himalayan vulture. So I thought, well, let's, let's take several different habitats. And so we'll go to three different spots in Northern India. We'll start in the Himalayan foothills We'll see if we can find some of the higher elevation vultures. And then we'll go to a place called Kealadeo National Park. And then uh, actually that'll be last. We'll go to Ranthambore second and then Kealadeo National Park. So here's what it's like in the Himalayan foothills, beautiful scenery. The view in the center bottom is of some of the high peaks in the Himalayas, though I'm about 
70 kilometers away from that and about, uh, oh, at least 10,000 feet in elevation below those highest peaks. I'm at, oh, between seven and 8,000 feet. I figured that was high enough. Beautiful mountain lakes are dotting the region. And we see not vultures in abundance, but what are called steppe eagles, S-T-E-P-P-E. -P -P -E. The steppe eagles are uh, beautiful birds that are much like our golden eagles, but uh, uh, they're not vultures. You also see many uh, Buddhist and uh, uh, Hindu temples, and those are dotted in the landscape. Those of you who are close to Ventana Wildlife Society may remember our staff biologist. Uh, well, actually she occupied many roles at Ventana, uh, Katie Lannon. Uh, she was with us for more than 10 years before she passed away because of cancer complications uh, just in January of 2020. Uh, anyway, Katie was pretty excited about me taking this trip. You see, she had made the trip before in better days, in her younger days. She went trekking in the Himalayas to visit some of these temples. And she would walk from temple to temple. And we discussed her journey in my last visit with her before I left. And she actually handed me her notes. And so I had the benefit of her notes with me as I made this trip. So how did I do? Well, probably not as well as Katie. Uh, a combination of a, an overnight train trip and a lavish meal at an Indian restaurant the night before uh, made me drag my feet a little bit as I was looking for vultures. And in fact, I could hardly even stand up. It was just uh, so uncomfortable. So I sat down on a rock to try to rest while the group went ahead. And as I was resting, I looked up and this is what I saw. A Himalayan vulture. So vulture number one. And actually, I'll have to say that the Himalayan vulture is not one of the critically endangered ones. It's one that you can see still fairly regularly. And I think that's because it inhabits such remote areas as the Himalayan foothills. It doesn't get into the lowlands where you find uh, a lot more people and you don't find the cattle operations that uh, are contributing to the poisoning that many of the vultures have experienced. And so the Himalayan vulture has really kind of escaped the major declines that some of the other vultures uh, have, have, uh, have, have undergone. So uh, uh, Joan, uh, if you can turn on your microphone, uh, is, is the Himalayan vulture one of our 23 species in our photo challenge that we have a submit, submission for or do we still need Himalayan vulture? So we are still looking for a Himalayan vulture. If anybody out there has um, traveled and seen one, we would love to have it as a part of our 23 vulture photo challenge. Right now, I can tell you we are up to 17 vultures of the 23. These are all photo submissions that have come in from across the world. The most recent submission I got just yesterday was the Indian vulture from one of our um, donors in India who is researching vultures and she sent me one of her Indian vulture photos. Um, I can tell you we are missing six of them. We're looking for the cape vulture, the slender billed vulture, the white rumped vulture, the bearded vulture, otherwise known as the lammergeier, uh, Kathy Hamilton's favorite, <laughs> Uh, the Himalayan vulture that Mike was just talking about, and then also the red-headed vulture. We have had so many lovely submissions um, all the way from Antwerp, Belgium, Florida, New York, Texas. Um, people have been really coming out with these vulture photos. 
And it's been really fun to see everybody's submissions because they're all kind of in different contexts, whether they're in somebody's backyard, up in a tree, feeding on an animal in Tanzania. Uh, we've been getting really, really fantastic submissions. So if you have any of those six that we're missing or even ones that we already have, we'd love to see them. We're putting them on the website, ventanaws.org slash challenge. I'll put it in our chat so that if you want to check out some of the submissions, um, yeah, we're still looking for that, that Himalayan. Yeah, well, if worse comes to worse, I can uh, send you uh, this photograph to add to the collection. Uh, even though it was taken in 2019, I, I, I still think that counts. Uh, a lot of the, you don't have to travel to India to submit your photos. You can go to a local zoo, and if they have a palm nut vulture, for example, you can uh, snap a picture of that and and send it to us. And it's kind of a fun uh, activity to try and see if we can get up to 23 vulture species. And if but I may, just really quickly, I forgot yeah. that um, by submitting a photo, we're also entering you into a lottery to win one of our Ventana VIP packages that has some really cool condor merch in it. Just as sort of a thank you for uh, sending us your vulture photos. We've been having a blast doing this, so thank you. Yeah, that's great. And I've, I've enjoyed looking through them. Even if we have multiple entries uh, per species, uh, please uh, send, send more, uh, even turkey vultures. Uh, like, like to see the different uh, situations the vultures are depicted. And needless to say, uh, the Himalayan vulture soaring over my head gave me new energy. And I screamed out to the group uh, so that they could see it as well. And in a few moments time, another vulture appeared and just did another circle around over our heads, even closer, it wasn't the Himalayan vulture, it was the red-headed vulture. And so I guess I could add that one to our uh, challenge and uh, check red-headed vulture off. And so those species, red-headed vulture and the, uh, and the Himalayan vulture were the, the species that I was able to see in small numbers uh, in the Himalayan foothills. And so that was a good start to the trip. Of course, when I got back, I had to uh, consult Katie's notes to see how she did. And I was surprised to see that she visited many of the same places I visited, yet she saw Lammergeiers, bearded vultures, on six of the days that she was there, six different days, she saw the Lammergeier. So I'm a little bit jealous and a little bit, uh, a little bit pleased that she was able to experience that uh, before she left us. We moved down to Ranth Rantham Boar National Park. The the tigers are the big draw here, the Bengal tigers, and, and we saw several of those, uh, including this uh, male, I believe, on the left. It's a place where there are animals all over the place. It's a national park, so with a lot of animals, and apparently a lot of animals uh, dying, this would be the place where you'd be able to see some vultures, right? You would think. So many animals, in fact, that you would have to just keep an eye on all of your things. If you were to leave your car unattended with luggage tied to the top, you would find the Langer monkeys rifling through your bags in just minutes. So a lot of activity here. Let's see what we find in Ranthambore National Park. Well, not much. We went on safari for three or four days and not a vulture to be seen. My guide tried to convince me that I was seeing a, an Indian vulture through the scope on a cliff face. And the guide was telling me, well, if you look in the right corner of the scope, its head is just peeking above the rock. I wasn't sure whether to believe him. 
at any rate, it wasn't a very satisfactory view until the very last day when an Indian vulture actually appeared through the fog and I was able to see it just for a moment. But again, this is just one bird in a place that really should have many vultures. So I move over to Kiel Ladeo National Park. This is where the decline of the vultures was first noticed and documented. There was a man uh, who was accustomed to viewing vultures at Kiel Ladeo National Park. And over the years, he noticed that there were fewer and fewer birds. And at one point in the 1990s, it just became almost devoid of vultures. It was alarming how few vultures there were. And this generated a lot of buzz and a lot of inquiries as to what the problems might be. And they actually discovered one of the causes with the help of the Peregrine Fund who analyzed some uh, vultures and found out that the uh, veterinary drug diclofenac was, uh, was, was to blame for these vulture deaths. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more momentarily. I did not see any uh, vultures at Kiel Ladeo National Park except for a few very distant Egyptian vultures. So on my trip, I saw maybe half of the species of vultures that I could have and all of them in rather low numbers. Nothing like the scene that you're looking at here where you have large groups of vultures feeding. So the question is, what's killing the vultures? And the main answer is poisoning. And for these slides, I've grouped it as unintentional poisoning and intentional poisoning. I'll, I'll also mention the, uh, the, the possibility of collisions with wind turbines. That's also an issue in some areas. But many of you who are familiar with our Condor Zoom chats know that lead poisoning is a big problem with California condors and is still the major threat to the long-term self-sustainability of the species. And this is lead from spent ammunition. The ammunition is not meant for the condors, it's meant for the animals that the hunters or ranchers are shooting. There might be a situation like you see illustrated here where condors are feeding on ground squirrels. Ground squirrels are not typically collected by the shooter, so they're available for scavengers like eagles and condors and other animals to uh, potentially be at risk of lead poisoning. In other areas of the world, the unintentional poisoning can take the uh, form of diclofenac and this drug is made to ease pain and suffering for animals as well as humans but when it's given to cattle it is meant to prolong their lives and prolong their working years to allow people more benefit from the animals that they own but these animals will die and if the diclofenac is in their system and it's ingested in the carcass by a scavenger, these scavengers can become casualties of this poison unintentionally. The, the decrease in vulture populations have been tied to the use of diclofenac Diclofenac was introduced, I believe, in the early 1990s. And that was about when the drop in vulture populations started. Diclofenac was then banned for veterinary use in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, 2006. 
And so since then, there has been a bit of recovery in the population. But what do you find when you have a loss of more than 95% of a vulture population? Well, you're gonna find that other scavengers will take their place. That can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. It's a good thing if you want to get rid of the carcasses, but it's a bad thing because the other scavengers are not as efficient as vultures. Vultures, when they consume carcasses, they present a dead end to the pathogens and the bacteria that could cause harm to human lives. Feral dogs, as an alternative, they act as a carrier. So if they ingest the pathogens, they can transmit it to others that they come into contact with. So what we've seen in India, and I saw it myself, is an increase in the feral dog population. And that coincides with a huge spike in rabies outbreak among humans in India. In fact, India contributes more than half of the world's uh, rabies cases among humans. And so you better believe that the Indian authorities are really looking into this situation and wondering, okay, how can we get the vultures back? We need them. And so this is a situation where the loss of vultures uh, has human health consequences in many areas of the world. But even worse than this is we have intentional poisoning. Now, who would do something like this? Well, probably someone who doesn't have uh, any regard for wildlife whatsoever. And in those ranks, rank uh, the poachers. Poaching is a particular problem in Africa. And the situation here is that the vultures are not poached necessarily. They're poisoned deliberately to try to evade detection by the authorities. Because what do vultures do? Well, they sort of converge on carcasses. And if you've just poached an elephant to remove its tusks, you do not want the vultures converging on your kill because that's a signal to the authorities of what's going on and they could be caught. So we're seeing this pattern of large die-offs of African vultures, primarily because they've been poisoned by poachers. And this is that same type of flow chart where you see poachers poach, poachers poison carcasses, and that becomes a problem for the vultures. Now we think of poaching as one of those third world problems, but in reality, poaching is a problem right here in central California. And it seems to be a problem for California condors. Uh, Condor Joe actually was telling us uh, a few weeks ago that a man was arrested in San Benito County for poaching and really piling up a large number of carcasses, was cited for poaching as well as using lead ammunition. Lead ammunition is uh, is banned for use when taking wildlife in California. When Joe asked the commissioners about the poaching problem locally, the commissioner answered and said, that case is just a tip of the iceberg. So while Ventana has a very robust non-lead outreach program for local hunters and ranchers, we're not reaching everybody, and certainly we're having difficulty reaching those 
who are shooting wildlife illegally. And that seems to be a big enough problem where we're still seeing lead exposure in California condors. And unfortunately, particularly since 2019, we are seeing a spike in lead associated condor deaths. The poaching is a problem. The availability of non-lead ammunition for use locally is also a problem. So with this poisoning issue, whether it's intentional or unintentional, we're seeing some of the same uh, problems and some of the same roadblocks towards recovery. For the unintentional side, lead has been banned for use for shooting wildlife in California, just like diclofenac has been banned for use uh, for cattle in India. But it's a slow process because with the diclofenac, it's been shown that it is available in the black market and that it is still being used to some extent. We know here that lead ammunition is still being used to some extent. Why? Well, because it is legal still to sell and buy lead ammunition, and it's still legal to use lead ammunition when shooting at target ranges. And so there is still some use of lead ammunition, particularly with the shortage of non-lead ammunition available right now in the market. So we have the good news that there is hope that the lead poisoning, the diclofenac poisoning will abate with time, but there are still some processes that need to be worked out. In Southern Europe in particular, collisions and electrocutions have been a problem for vultures. And certainly the large wind farms in Southern Spain have uh, spent a lot of time addressing this situation. They are right in the vulture migration route. Yes, some vultures do migrate and they kind of funnel through Spain, the Strait of Gibraltar into Morocco and so there's a lot of individuals moving into a small amount of space. And of course, vultures and raptors like wind, and that's why the wind turbines are there because of the wind potential. And so we've seen some collisions with uh, raptors and, and vultures in Europe. Luckily, there are some quick fixes that have helped reduce those incidents somewhat they can, through technology, determine when waves of vulture flights are coming and they can shut down turbines that are in those paths. And so with strategic shutdowns of wind turbines, they've helped reduce the collision rate among vultures. It's still a problem, but it's one that's decreased quite a bit. Here on the Central Coast, we've worked cooperatively with PG&E to reduce incidents of collision and electrocutions among California condors. PG&E has always answered the bell in terms of retrofitting lines that we have shown to be risky or even burying power lines altogether to avoid the risk to condors. So we're happy with the fact that PG&E has uh, developed that uh, positive reaction towards condor conservation locally here in Central California. During our Zoom chats, I've been asked the question, what can we do to help condors and other species of vultures? What can the average person do? And my answer is always pretty standard. You, you can do things with your vote. You can do things uh, with your voice. And you can do things with your wallet. And supporting the organizations that do good for wildlife, that 
do good for the environment are certainly worthwhile investments. Your support of Feathers in Flight is helping condors. But is there more that we can do as just average ordinary people? And that, that question can be a little bit more difficult because these people that ask the question, they want, they want tangible things that they can go out and do for these birds. And it's something that takes a lot of thought. Now that you know the issues that these vulture species are faced with, uh, it gives you a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of more to build ideas on in terms of helping vultures. And so as an illustration, I'm going to introduce you to an Indian woman named Purnima Barman. Take you back to India for our closing slides. And we find that Purnima is an ordinary person. She's upward mobile though, uh, because she is going to school to get her advanced degree in some environmental field. And so she does have a concern about the environment, but she doesn't have a lot of clout. She doesn't have a lot of voice as a woman in her village in India. I'd also like to introduce you to the adjutant. This is an attractive bird, isn't it? It's not a vulture, but boy, it sure looks like one. It has many of the characteristics of vultures. It's a, it's a stork, but many people will tell you, rightly so, that condors and vultures are rather closely related to storks. And so I throw this in as an example of a species that can be helped with an ordinary civilian effort. Well, we go back to Purnima. She was walking in her village and she found that there was a tree filled with these nesting adjutants. She learned more about them and she found that they were very rare. Actually, her village was one of the few places where you could see this bird. Talk about critically endangered. This species is down to less than 1,000 individuals. And this, these birds are relegated to an area in Northeast India. Well, one day while she was out walking and checking on these birds, she noticed that a man was shaking the tree to try to get these birds to fall and the chicks to fall, and then he was killing them on the ground. Now, this is a bird that is widely despised among villagers in India. It's not a particularly clean species. This bird makes quite a mess on the private properties that it nests near. It's often found near garbage dumps. And so it has an unsavory reputation and it is rather despised. And so when Purnima rushed over and tried to get the man to stop killing these birds, she was met with laughter. She entreated others to help her and no one would help. And so she thought, what can I do to protect these birds that are obviously defenseless? So she organized her own little army to try to change the impression that the villagers had of this bird. She wanted to give this bird an image makeover. And so what she did, she went and she enlisted the local Indian women. She felt that the women might have more compassion and might be more uh, excited about being able to raise their voice in their community where they might get a position where their voice means something. And so these were women who were eager to say something 
eager to do something for the environment for these birds. So she organized the local women. They incorporated the adjutant into some of their ritual dances, into some of their ritual costumes. And she started holding festivals and the community started to embrace this species as something special rather than something that they wanted to get rid of. As far as conservation measures, there were some simple things that, that she realized could be done. They could put nets under these trees so that when the chicks would fall from the nest, they would not fall to their death. They would be safe. Simple things, but really this image makeover was the thing that turned the tide and changed the adjutant from a species that was just about to go extinct in their local vid villages to a species that is now on the increase. And so Purnima has actually won many awards from the Indian government for her work conserving the adjutant, just an average person. Could an image makeover work for vultures as well? I say yes. I'm seeing on explore.org, when I visit the comments section, I'm hearing comments like, I love these birds. These birds are beautiful. These birds are handsome. And it really is nice to hear that when we find beauty in things that maybe we didn't expect to find beauty in, I think it changes our depth of what we can do as humans in terms of human kindness. I think it unlocks a whole nother layer of kindness that resides in us when we find the good in all of these species that maybe on the surface we don't find attractive. By the way, I, I would not recommend uh, kissing a vulture on the, on the bill like that. Uh, this is a very brave man. Uh, even in captivity, uh, I would keep my face uh, quite far from the vultures as much as I love them. Uh, this is not recommended. Uh, this is a captive uh, breeding facility and we're finding over many portions of the world, we're finding releases now occurring of different vulture species. We're finding releases in India. And now starting in 2012, the tide has turned. 2012 was, I believe, the first year where we went from a declining vulture population to an increasing vulture population. Very slight, but certainly a good sign that we're getting more vultures in these countries that are hardest hit. And the captive breeding and release programs have helped augment those populations. So we're seeing it in India. Here's a photo of the Egyptian vulture. This is one being released in Armenia, the highlands of Mer Armenia that has uh, a robust population of lammergeiers, but the Egyptian vulture population is in decline there. And so we're seeing releases all over the place, just like Ventana Wildlife Society is releasing condors in Central California. Other organizations are funding releases in different parts of the world to help save vulture populations. And also we have the hope of International Vulture Awareness Day. We've had this for quite some time now where if you go on the International Vulture Awareness Day, I believe it's the bird life page, but if you Google uh, International Vultures uh, Awareness Day or, or International Vultures, you'll land on this page. And there is a list of all the organizations, including Ventana Wildlife Society, celebrating 
the first Saturday in September as International Vulture Awareness Day. There are nearly 100 organizations now working actively on this day to promote vulture conservation. And these are organizations all throughout the world. I invite you to take a look at those. Ventana is one of them, Peregrine Fund's another. There are many other zoos that are local and, and even not so local. Some of the zoos are offering free admission to bald-headed guests in honor of Vulture Awareness Day. So I encourage you to look at those organizations, support those organizations that are doing work around the world to promote vulture conservation. You're tuned in with Ventana Wildlife Society. There's more programming ahead. Join us Thursday at 4 p.m. for the virtual tour Big Sur Condor Sanctuary. Uh, you'll get to see behind the scenes look at our sanctuary, some of the places that you don't necessarily see on our website or on explore.org. Uh, get the behind the scenes uh, tour uh, uh, there with uh, Kelly Sorensen and, and Condor Joe. Joan and Kathy will join you on Sunday for our photo finish. Find out if we can reach 23 vulture species during our extravaganza and you get to see some of the uh, photos that have been submitted, as well as a few awards, I believe, that will be announced. And of course, all week long, check out our online auction, place your bids. There's some really unique, one-of-a-kind condor and vulture art that I guarantee you no one else will have. And so I welcome you to check that out and join us for that. And that is my last slide. Thank you so much for joining me on this little talk. If you have any questions about vultures, I'd, I'd love to stick around and, and uh, answer those for you as best I can. And uh, uh, Kathy and Joan, if you have anything more to add about the festivities that are yet to come, uh, please, uh, please take the reins from here. I just shared the link in the chat with everyone for the photo challenge. You can go check out all the photos that we have so far. I am adding them as we speak, all the entries we've been getting. We have so many wonderful vulture photos coming in. And um, Kathy and I will be picking out some of the top photos, talking about them on Sunday um, and having a lot of fun with that. Good. Seeing if there are any questions but um other than that yeah check out the photo challenge thanks guys yeah and also uh this afternoon uh, it could be happening now if you're on our website on the on the condor cam page or on explore.org um, take a check uh, to greet the new uh, condor arrivals to the san simeon pen those birds will be uh, housed there for uh, a number of weeks to get used to their environment and then they will be released uh, uh, a little bit later on uh, in in the fall but that's your chance to get your first look at them hopefully they'll arrive soon hopefully they haven't been caught in traffic and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get them in the pen um i do have a couple questions if you have a moment mike um Absolutely. do you happen to know what the most endangered vulture is we know that Con California condors are critically endangered. Who else is up there with them? Yeah, uh, fortunately, in terms of numbers, there are none that are as in dire circumstances as the California condor. Uh, condor, I think we're uh, above 300 individuals in the wild globally. The other vultures, um, I think they're all above at least a thousand. Uh, the white rumped vulture comes to my mind as one that is particularly uh, endangered and particularly low. I think, and I, I, I sometimes get white rumped and, and, and one of the others uh, confused, uh, but I believe that is the one that declined not just 
95%, not just 97% like the Indian vulture, but actually 99% over its historical numbers. And so that's a species that numerically, there are more than California condors, but the concern might be even more because with the condors, we might be getting a, a greater handle on the th lead threat, whereas the intentional poaching issue is a problem that's very difficult to remedy. And so you really have to fear for some of these species in Africa and even some in Asia that are declining by huge amounts, but yet still number more than the California condor. So it's something that we have to keep our eyes on and really watch those trends in addition to the, the low numbers. Thanks, Mike. Um, we also have a question about vultures versus condors. All condors are vultures, correct? Vulture is the umbrella term. That's right, yeah. And not all vultures are condors. So, so yeah, of those 23 species of vultures, two of which are condors, the Andean condor and the California condor. And so the vultures, it's really, in my opinion, more of a, more of just a, a naming issue where it seems like there are some vultures in, in Africa in particular that are so similar to California condors that they could have been called condors, I think, but they're called vultures. It's just a, a taxonomic uh, a name that uh, condors have been given and, and the, the old world vultures are still called vultures, but I think of lappet-faced vulture as having many condor similarities, certainly in size, uh, there are vultures in the old world that are similar, uh, you know, getting close to condor size, but yet are still called vultures. So we lump them all as vultures. We consider them all vultures, but California condor and Andean condor have a, have a special name. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, and any suggestions for um, finding injured wildlife? In the wild, I would assume that we probably have some different organizations across the states. I know we get phone calls at our front desk a lot looking for referrals for injured wildlife, but um, yeah, yeah, do you have any pointers? Yeah, it really depends on your location, and that's that's one of those things where you just have to uh, search on online uh, uh, wildlife rehabilitator near you. Uh, I guess Monterey SPCA uh, around here is a is a is a resource. And certainly if you get close, it's worth a phone call. They can probably get you closer in terms of uh, places to, to take something. Uh, years ago, I, I worked for Hawks Aloft in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they, uh, they had a number of volunteers who did raptor rehabilitation. So in New Mexico, that is a resource, Hawks Aloft, to, uh, to collect injured uh, birds in particular. You can call them anywhere in the state of New Mexico and they will drive there and pick up uh, the raptor and get it to uh, some, some veterinary care. And so that's, uh, that's an example of a local resource. Uh, it just depends on, on where, you're, where you're at. Awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, and then last question, uh, what's the event that you suggested looking into after this talk um, online? Was it International Vulture Awareness Day? That might be the answer. Uh, yeah, a, a couple of things. Uh, the, uh, I suggested uh, just visiting the, uh, the International Vulture Awareness Day website just to, just to see the vast uh, assemblage of organizations that are working towards uh, vulture conservation. The Vulture Awareness uh, Day actually passed. It was last Saturday. Ventana, we decide that we're just going to make a whole week of it. And so we're going on through next weekend as well. 
So a lot of the festivities that are uh, for Vulture Awareness Day have actually passed, some haven't, but uh, certainly check out International Vulture Awareness Day to see those different organizations and also maybe to prime yourself for, for next September as well. And then as far as other uh, wildlife viewing online, check out our website and explore.org to see the new birds uh, filtering into their pen for their pre-release uh, acclimation. Uh, you can get a first look at the condors that are, that are coming in. I don't remember how many, but uh, it's a small cohort of, of, of newbies that are showing up to San Simeon. Uh, I, I think those are the, the two items that I, uh, that I mentioned. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mike. We so appreciate all of the information. We are um, really excited to share all of our vulture photos with everyone. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram. Um, our emails that we'll be sending out, we'll be updating everybody throughout the week of all of our vulture findings. So thank you again, and we'll see everybody on Thursday. Anything else to add, Kathy? No. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you Have next time. Bye.